If you thought market volume would pick up now that the eclipse has passed, you might want to keep those glasses on for just a little bit longer. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. And if CPI doesn't deliver tomorrow, now what? I think Earnings I'll just Friday? just go home for the rest of the week. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's get a check in here on where markets are. So we're trading a little heavy all across the indices. We're off the lows of the session, though the S&P is down by just four-tenths of 1%. I want to look under the hood at some of the things because what's really moving is the bond market as well as commodities. So Freeport is up by over 2%. That's a copper play. Copper at the highest level since June of 2022. Let's go down to gold, sitting at yet another record high. Scra many are still scratching their heads as to why gold continues to move higher, if in theory rates are also going to move higher. Not today, though. Uh, the 10-year yields down five basis points. We got bidding all across the curve, despite the fact that three-year auction came in and was a little bit meh. Uh, not a lot of demand there. I had to offer a lot more yield to bring that demand in. We get the 10-year tomorrow, though, Remain That should be quite interesting. Yeah, Matt, really has been the story for the last few days and weeks, and this is another middling market day, specifically when it comes to the equities. S&P stocks right now, about half of the members in the S&P 500, they are higher on the day. That includes Alphabet, Apple, Moderna, but then about half the S&P stocks are lower on the day, like NVIDIA, Meta, and Royal Caribbean. It all pretty much cancels out. You got a benchmark fractionally lower and still stuck in a tight trading range. That's tightness that, including today, We've seen it move up or down by less than 1% on 61 of the 73 trading sessions that we've had so far this year. And on half those days, 34 to be precise, the S&P rose or fell less than half a percentage point. That's tight, and that's a tightness that we've been dealing with now for the past few days and weeks. Now, the good news is that the S&P is trying to hold that pivot line around 5,200. The bad news, the index is still sits about 12% above that 200-day moving average. That's a bad sign, at least historically, because that has been the gap that in the past has preceded significant losses for stocks, like what we saw back in 2011, like what we saw back in 2015 and again in 2018. Furthermore, if you look at the options market, that so-called 25 delta put skew has been inching higher over the last few days, suggesting options traders are coming around to the notion that at least a modest pullback in prices is up ahead. But Chris Harvey at Wells Fargo Security says there's no reason to be shook. Just yesterday, he put Wall Street's highest year-end target on the S&P, lifting his forecast to 55.35. That's more than 6% higher than where the index trades today. It's a bullish call, Alex, based on what he says is secular optimism. So let's talk about strategists, because mm -hmm. do forecasts actually matter right now? Yeah. Particularly look at the jobs number, forecast after forecast after forecast, uh, they all just got them wrong. And it's very similar uh, when it comes to inflation. Um, now, as you know, overall, CPI has been rising and beating expectations. And that's the point. Beating expectations is a great chart from John Authors that just shows how increased uh, CPI is above what analysts are actually estimating. We're surprising to the upside. And you can just see here, this is that 2 percent line uh, that the Fed's really looking for. And here's where we're sticky. We're staying. We're right there around 3.2 percent. So I mean, my question is like, we're going to look at the forecast, but do they actually mean anything anymore? Because inflation just keeps holding on to that higher level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, something we're going to spend a lot of time discussing here on the big show today. Kicking you off to the close this Tuesday afternoon with Michael Remack. He's head of investments for City Global Wealth at Work, joining us today in Studio 2. Michael, great to have you. Nice to be here. This has been a week where everyone, I think, is laser focused on inflation and for that matter, earnings as well. But let's start uh, with inflation. Uh, there's been a lot of concern about that disinflationary trend maybe hitting a speed bump here. I mean, what type of, uh, I guess, concern, if at all, are you hearing from clients? Yeah, let's talk about that, because uh, the setup for tomorrow is really if you're an investor, I think you've got to take the good news as good news. Mm -hmm. You look at what we're coming off of last week where we had the ISM poking above 50. We've got the Fed forecasting growth through 2026 uh, and you know the setup for tomorrow is really that all the focus is on inflation and what we're most focused on is really uh, how the Fed views inflation in the context of employment we don't believe that the Fed needs to crush employment in order to move down that path of cutting rates and that's going to be really important what we should start to see is a path to two and a half percent by the end of this year. That's our view. Mm -hmm. We think we're going to see that flow through with some of the uh, shelter prices, which are a lagging indicator, really starting to make their way into the numbers. Tomorrow uh, could be a, a little bit iffy because we've got oil obviously factoring in. Mm -hmm. That's going to you know, boost CPI up a bit. Mm -hmm. But I think overall we see a path to two and a half percent. And that's going to give the Fed room to follow through with some of those cuts. Do you think the market is more concerned about 
uh, inflation and the Fed, or are they more concerned about corporate fundamentals and what then what signals are going to come out of the next earnings season? Look, I, I think uh, I think it's a balance of the two. Mm-hmm. And as we look at the earnings picture, we actually see uh, a fairly uh, positive outlook. And this earnings season, which is going to really kick off at the end of this week with the banks, should be characterized by a real broadening out of the earnings picture, right? We had a very concentrated in tech. Mm-hmm. So you look at a Q1 that's seasonally stronger than Q4. We're, going to, we're expecting that this year, nine of the 11 S&P sectors are going to pause, post positive EPS gains. That's also the market consensus. We see that broadening out to all 11 sectors in 2025. We actually think that this quarter we could see on on average 6% beat uh, in terms of street expectations. Wow, that's pretty positive. So does all of that, though, mean that we need to see inflation continuing to trend down so we continue to be in that Goldilocks scenario for earnings to make that kind of those kind of numbers? I think what we're seeing is um, a a resilient employment picture, but the employment picture is also cooling off. And I think that's flowing into profits. And I think the big story this year has been that improvement in corporate profit margins. We're going to see that, you know, obviously play through in terms Mm -hmm. of earnings and valuations. Okay, so what's the best uh, allocation? What do you like right now? Well, I mean, uh, not surprisingly, we are slightly overweight equities in our uh, strategic asset allocation, tactically overweight equities. Uh, we also, you know, like sectors like healthcare that really didn't participate in the recovery in 2023, and specifically within healthcare areas like biotech uh, and medical supplies, which, you know, are really immune to a lot of the politics and policy. Um, we also like global diversification. So a lot of investors, I think, naturally have a U.S. home bias. We've seen over the last 15 years, mm-hmm. U.S. go from uh, 50% to 70% of global market cap. Yeah. We don't think over the next 15 years that's going to trend to 90. Mm-hmm. So we think the cost of being globally diversified uh, has, has improved materially. You know, bonds is another yeah. area in this interest rate environment where you've got to look at investment grade, including munis, and yeah. even in preferreds very attractive for longer-term investors. Uh, Well said. Uh, I do want to get your thoughts here. Uh, uh, We only have a little bit of time left, but I want to talk a little bit about your business. And I know you can't get into any numbers as to what's going on in city overall here, but the business you're part of, this city global wealth at work business, you guys have been on a big expansion spree uh, over the last uh, three years or so. I know Jane Frazier has specifically cited this unit as being key to her goal of really building out that wealth management business. Uh, I mean, how much has the uptake been now that you've kind of expanded the umbrella uh, for the types of clients that this business is going after? Uh, it, look, it's really been extraordinary, mm-hmm. Romain. I've been part of this business at City for 14 years. It actually has its roots going back almost 55 years mm-hmm. dealing with successful global law firms and the lawyers who work there. But really, this workplace wealth management model that serves highly successful, busy working professionals, we expanded a few years ago to uh, cover industries such as management consulting asset management and other types of corporates. And so, you know, we think that what we provide, which is really a a high touch private banking experience for busy working professionals, uh, is something that, you know, these employers are really looking to get behind and sponsor so that their people can focus on doing their jobs, being successful, Mm -hmm. and then eventually, you know, leave the firm to do something else in life in great financial shape. All right, Mike, uh, great to have you on the program. Going to have to leave it there. Michael Remack over at City Global Wealth at Work, helping us kick off to the close uh, here on this Tuesday afternoon. Coming up in just a bit, we're going to talk uh, about Mazda, the company saying that it's an intentional follower approach to adopting EVs. It's t- perfectly timed to meet demand, a conversation up ahead with the president and CEO. Yep, they were really talking about hybrids, and that paid off. So why one analyst says she is keeping an eye on the valuations of U.S. Steel and Cleveland Cliffs. That's coming up in our top calls. And we're going to count you down to the closing bells with Kara Murphy, Chief Investment Officer over at Kestra. All that and more coming up in just a bit. Don't go anywhere. This is The Close on Bloomberg. season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. Context changes everything.
right, time now for stock of the hour. And today we're going to take a look at Moderna. So shares are rising today, the best performing stock within the S&P. After new data from a trial on cancer vaccines excited some analysts about its potential, Jeffries called these results, quote, interesting, which I guess in this speak is pretty good. Uh, here with more is Bloomberg Health reporter Robert Langwith. Uh, he joins us now. Hey, Bob, walk us through these trials and what we learned. Uh, yeah, so Moderna is testing a... Uh the old term for it was a cancer vaccine. They're testing it in combination with uh, partner Merck in combination with immune therapy drug Keytruda. They're testing it for a lot of different cancers, and the lead use is melanoma. And there was some new data out this weekend, some preliminary data uh, out the last few days on uh, in head and neck cancer, the vaccine in head and neck cancer, which has caught uh, some analysts' attention. Now, that's kind of preliminary data. The, uh, the farthest along use is really melanoma, and that's in a large-scale trial right now going on with Merck and uh, with their partner Merck. They're all, or also starting trials in other types of cancers, such as lung cancer. So this is kind of a very broad program that people knew about. Uh, but anyway, with this head and neck cancer data, despite being kind of very early, has caught some analysts' attention, some investors' attention today. Uh, I'm curious, Bob, though. I mean, how serious should we take this? I feel like we've had a few other sort of uh, moments in time with Moderna where we finally sort of saw what the future of this company can be beyond COVID here. Is this going to end up being a head fake or is there real substance here? Uh, this is just, you know, this is just one very kind of early trial. Uh, you know, it's a promising result, but, you know, it's a very early trial, very preliminary, and had neck cancer. And again, uh, the bigger picture is that they're you know, farther along with this very same product uh, in combination with the Merck's drug for other types of cancer. And we really want to, we need for the, we, we really are waiting uh, for the longer term results. Uh, in trials and other types of cancer, such as melanoma, which is the farthest along one in lung cancer. So this data today, frankly, is quite incremental. Uh, it's in a new type of cancer, but it's quite incremental and quite early. Uh, so in terms of you know, getting approval for this type of cancer, that would be a number of years off. Uh, and is really it's not the lead use uh, for this uh, cancer vaccine product. Uh, in this space, though, uh, Pfizer also made some news here. Its RSV shot apparently has now worked well in young adults as well as older people, so they could pursue and get U.S. approval. That would compete with Moderna's shot. This kind of sets them up for Moderna-Pfizer uh, COVID vaccine, but now on the RSV front. Uh, yeah, so Moderna's actually number three potentially number three to the market in RSV, because both Pfizer and Glaxo are already on the market for RSV. And Pfizer, what they're going to try to do is expand usage of their RSV shot to younger adults. So Moderna's not even on the market yet. They could get a decision uh, next month uh, for the RSV shot. That's obviously very important to them, because uh, it would be only their second, uh, second approved uh, mRNA product. Uh, so that's a very important upcoming decision for them. But then they're going to have to compete against two companies are already on the market for RSV, so they're going to have a heavy competition there. Have we heard anything at all, Robert, about potential pricing? Uh, I, I don't know details on that. The companies usually don't announce the potential pricing of something before it is approved. Uh, so if Moderna's announced something on that front, I, don't, I haven't heard about it. All right, Bob, always great to talk to you. Bob Langworth, who helps uh, cover health care for us here at Bloomberg. A closer look at shares of Moderna. Those shares higher by about 6% here on the day. Also moving higher as well, U.S. Steel. Uh, Wolf Research actually changing its tune on steel companies with an upgrade of U.S. Steel, a downgrade on Cleveland Cliffs. We're going to talk to the analyst behind the call in just a second. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we're going to start today with Lululemon. Piper Sandler dropping its price target down to 470 from 525. The analyst saying Lulu still a favorite among teenage girls, but only time will tell if that sticks as teen shoppers are notoriously fickle. They also noted increasing competition from brands like uh, Aloe Yoga as well as Viore. Still, the analysts standing by their overweight rating, though. Investors, at least for today, kind of bailing out. The shares down about a percent on the day. Next up, let's take a look at ChargePoint. Goldman Sachs pulling the plug on the maker of EV chargers with a downgrade to sell. The analyst Mark Delaney citing slower growth in the number of EVs on the road in the U.S. and rising competition 
for those charging slots. The price target cut to a street low, $1.50 a share. Those shares moving lower about 5% on the day. And finally, U.S. Steel, a bright spot here on the day with Wolf Research upgrading to outperform with a $46 price target. The analyst over there, Tim Tanner, says the stock looks relatively cheap on a standalone basis despite estimates that fall below the company's own forecast. She also says investors have overly excluded any chance of that Nippon Steel takeover, even though post-election could present an opportunity. Those shares higher by about 3% on the day. And those are some of our top calls. Now, we do want to stick with that last call there on U.S. Steel, which also included a cut in rating on Cleveland Cliffs, citing the recent rally in those shares, which contrasted with earnings estimates. Here to talk about it a little bit more is Tim Tamner's equity research analyst at Wolf Research covering metals and mining. All right, let's start off with U.S. Steel X, because I, I found this interesting. Is this just a valuation call? Is there a little bit more in this as to why you're optimistic around the shares? I think it's a relatively interesting story. Um, we're not really bullish on steel prices, but the move in U.S. Steel has been kind of uh, kind of surprising, considering that the company expects to make two billion this year, three billion next year. There's no way they're going to take a lowball bid, even if the Nippon deal doesn't doesn't go through, which we think is is very possible. The company, on a standalone basis, looks interesting, uh, especially relative to peers that have had a good run. And we think that, you know, even on our below consensus estimates, mid 40s is easily achievable. And the company on a standalone basis with some of their growth projects actually could be pretty sticky here. Hey, Timna, it's Alex. So good to see you. Um, so you think that no deal with Nippon is going to happen? You know, we think the probability is more likely than not that there will not be a deal. If there is a deal, it would likely have to happen after the election. It's uh, pretty unprecedented to have a sitting president oppose a transaction like this, but that's what's happened. And so to back off of that uh, very uh, clear stance seems to us unlikely. Uh, you know, Biden wanted the union endorsement. He got it. Uh, Trump has also stood out as against this um, transaction. So that that leaves the odds pretty difficult in our view. But again, it could sneak through perhaps after the election, if at all. Gotcha. OK, but either way, as a standalone company, it's still OK. Now, Cleveland Cliffs, you also cut the recommendation on that company to underperform from peer perform. Opposite view there. How come? Well, Cliffs has had a big run in the last couple of months, so about 16 percent. And if you look at what's happening to earning estimates in that same period, they've, they've retreated. And actually, if you look at steel prices, which we think should be relevant for this group, steel prices have pulled back substantially from some of the highs we saw earlier this year. So earnings power has uh, retreated, and yet the stock has been quite strong. Didn't, we couldn't really find a good reason for it, and it seems to us like this relative um, difference in performance uh, justified the moves today. So when, when it comes to the M&A strategy, particularly when it comes to Cleveland Cliffs here, Tim, and you overlay that with some of the current concerns out there right now about the bid that's on the table for U.S. Steel, uh, do you anticipate, at least, and this is specifically to Cleveland Cliffs, that they will continue with that M&A strategy, even though that strategy is a little bit more contained within the U.S.? It's been pretty uh, clear that they would like to continue to consolidate the U.S. industry. We think that they could do so, but... We also think there'll be constraints with regard to antitrust that we were concerned about with their bid for U.S. Steel is there would be an excess uh, control over automotive sheet and appliance sheet, among many others. So well, they could look for some smaller acquisition targets. Um, we spelled out some of those in some of our research. But, um, you know, I think that's something they could look at. Uh, definitely we'll see if there's other constraints out there from foreign and governments that they could pursue or Russian entities, but um, it's something they could could follow. Yes. Is there is there at all? I mean, because we talk about this through the lens of some of the uh, political issues going on between various countries, and uh, you know whether whatever we're trying to protect here. Is there a sense here that when you look at these companies, and you look at the, really the industry as a whole here, are we just kind of destined for an industry that has to be more insular, has to be more domestic, or do you maybe see a break in the future where maybe we have a little bit more of a global footprint? Well, the U.S. market is already some of the highest priced steel in the world. With the 25 percent tariffs on many countries that were put in place by President Trump a couple years ago, that makes the steel industry already quite protected. Um, the U.S. steel industry is net short, needs to import. With some of the new capacity coming on, it could be more self-sufficient. But that said, it's going to be a challenging to find a situation where the U.S. steel price can remain at a huge premium relative to the rest of the world. And I would argue that having a, a high-priced steel market does the country a disservice by making us less competitive 
with uh, manufacturing and, and uh, you know, building uh, and construction, et cetera. So I'd say, yes, you know, the, the industry is somewhat insulated and protected, but it can only go so far. Yeah, I have to say, if you're looking for steel prices, like, and you want to just get a global view, it's like impossible to get a clean read because it's hot rolled, it's something else, it's a different roll, and then it's like all over globally at the same time. Which just brings me to the point of like, what is the real supply and demand picture, uh, Timna, for steel? Like, we need all the steel to build the things for the energy transition, but I have zero idea of like what that uh, supply profile looks like. Sure. I mean, when we think about energy transition, people generally talk more about copper, but, you know, you need rebar for the foundation of some of these large projects, and that's positive for rebar makers. Most of the steel names we cover are focused on sheet, and that goes more into auto and appliances and, and some construction, right? Construction is 50 percent of demand. Automotive is usually about 25 percent of demand. So that's really how it shakes out. Do we get, ever get to a point, though, where it does become a strategic asset, if you will? We've spoken with so many uh, executives on this program, particularly those in uh, certain industries have talked about how hard it is to source uh, uh, steel as well as other sort of metals that they need to make things. Uh, and this idea that with some of the import restrictions and export restrictions, that that's going to make it even harder for them. Uh, when do we sort of cross that threshold? I think what, what the U.S. needs is a competitive steel industry. I think there's some products that are kind of uh, challenging to make. And I think that uh, for the most part, what you need is a, a various suppliers. You can't have just one. And in some of the more difficult products to make, we need to be expert. We need the expertise there for sure. But again, it needs to be competitive. We can't have a market that's completely isolated with price. And I think the industry is capable. It's capable of being competitive, has the know-how, has the raw materials, has the good work ethic, and I think it's quite possible. But there's quite a bit of protectionism out there already, and I don't think that we need to see more concentration of protectionism to be competitive. Hey, Timna, good to catch up. Thanks a lot, Timna Tanners over at Wolf Research. Really appreciate your time. Um, as we were just speaking, uh, Romain, Rafael Bostic is in a Yahoo Finance interview, and just one, something he said that I found interesting. He said that the CPI coming in at consensus would be a welcome development. Like, just don't go up. Yeah. You don't have to go down. Just don't go up. Yeah, I mean, but it's interesting, too, because, I mean, he talks about this idea how they really may need to delay further rate cuts and this idea, too, that uh, no matter what's going on with CPI, meaning the report tomorrow, the idea is that they've already seen a trend here. And, you know, when they go into that meeting, and I don't know how Jay Powell is going to sort of bully them into what he wants to do. You know, he makes those calls before these meetings here. If Jay Powell is committed to making that cut in June here, I think he's going to have an uphill battle really selling at least people like Raphael Bostic and quite a few others who really just don't think it's time. Yeah, who talks about, um, Bostic also saying there's a slow pace of disinflation this year, right? So there is that. And also demand for service is still quite high. The way you kill that is with rate, higher rates. So yep. go figure. All right, coming up, uh, Mazda is looking to drive growth in the U.S. We have the president and CEO uh, joining us next. That's coming up next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in a oh, very hot New York City. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. I know I haven't been outside, so is it warm? It's 73 degrees outside. Alex Some Steele. say it's nice. And you don't even need those little eclipse, eclipse classes. I, I don't. I don't. My, I feel yeah. much better, by the way. Yeah, don't just, stare in the sun. Just in case uh, we were a little worried about yeah. that. Yeah, well, the market's still kind of middling today. I think everyone's still kind of in that holding pattern for the CPI report tomorrow. And my question is, like, if that's not an upside or downside surprise, then what do we beat the drum to? Earnings. Okay, then we get JP Morgan uh, on Friday. If that doesn't deliver something exciting, then what? Like, we're just pushing the can down the road for a big catalyst. Yeah, well, there is uh, a few things out there there to talk about a few things moving Boeing not having a good day at all we were expecting those delivery numbers for the first quarter and we got them and they were bad the lowest going back to mid 2021 highlighting how far the company has to go on its road to recovery from those recent incidents with its planes the shares just this hour falling even further after comments from a whistleblower about safety issues was published in the new york times boeing pushing back on those accusations all this sort of feeds into the, a lot of concern here not just about the company but really about the health of the supply chain and how that may be contributing to some of the issues going on out there joining us right now is lisa anderson she's the president of lma consulting group uh, which is really an expert in this space and what's going on with supply chains and we do want to get your broader view, but I want to start, Lisa, first uh, with Boeing and, and whether we know a lot of the, the issues going on with them are kind of self-inflicted, a lot of internal decisions. But we were kind of at this point where the supply chain issues from the pandemic seem to have sorted themselves out. Now we're dealing with this. How much of that is going to have an impact? 
Well, it's definitely going to have an impact. Uh, you're right. The uh, supply chain has largely recovered as of late last year. Uh, however, there have been uh, widespread shortages and uh, labor shortages uh, up until now. Uh, and now with this uh, change from Boeing and the issues that are uh, trickling down the supply chain, the supply chain has been on uh, aggressive uh, aggressive growth uh, of um, inventory to make sure that they can uh, meet the uh, projections. And now that uh, the quality issues have come up, they're stuck with a lot of inventory and um, backpedaling. It just sort of raises the question for what's the demand part and what's the supply part in terms of what the issues are for, say, Boeing? So the Boeing has significant demand out there from their customers, uh, like United Airlines, American Airlines, those types of folks. Um, however, um, since they've run into these issues with quality, they clearly are not, not able to supply uh, enough aircraft uh, to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. And the FAA has put in um, put restrictions on the demand, meaning how much they could produce, because they wanted to make sure they could produce quality products, which is, of course, critical. Uh, and so that same concept goes to their, su to their supply chain. Right. So now their supply chain has, has uh, inventory um, ready to fulfill uh, the demand because the demand was expected to increase um, over the next uh, few years. Uh, however, the uh, supply, you know, the, the demand from Boeing now is, has been reduced because they're uh, cut back because of the FAA's uh, restrictions. Right. So a little bit of both, basically, when it comes to Boeing. On a broader sense, right, I feel like we got our supply chains uh, under, uh, we're working it out, everything was going better, and then all of a sudden the Francis Key Bridge uh, collapsed, and then that sort of disrupted supply chains again. If you were to rate where we are in supply chain issues, how are we doing in the U.S.? <laughs> well, um, really good question. If we consider uh, one to be, uh, you know, really awful and ten to be great, uh, you know, we we largely work through the issues. However, it has, you know, there's just so many disruptions continuing to come up. So I would say we're four. We're four. That doesn't sound very good. Yep. Uh, right. <laughs> no. But if you think about it, there was the uh, bridge collapse, the Houthi rebels uh, shooting uh, or attacking uh, container ships in the in the uh, Suez Canal, and the, the Panama Canal is is experiencing drought conditions. Uh, Boeing. <laughs> we just were talking about Boeing. So wherever you look, there seems to be uh, challenges. All right, Lisa, thanks a lot. We really appreciate that perspective. LMA Consulting Group President Lisa Anderson uh, joining us there. Let's stay with supply chains because some auto companies did have to rethink routes after the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed a few weeks ago. And that brings us to the subject of our next guest. Mazda is looking to expand its presence in the U.S. The company says the timing of its EV, quote, intentional follower strategy is paying off as demand for hybrid models now continued to rise. Here in studio with more is Masahiro Moro, President and CEO of Mazda. Moro-san, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So let's just start where we left off on supply chains. Are you noticing any impact currently in the U.S. when it comes to uh, bringing in vehicles because of the Baltimore Bridge collapse? Yeah, at the moment, uh, our operation team has been closely working with the port of Baltimore and a concerned entity to find out uh, port points uh, nearby for in inbound vessels. And also we are working for, you know, alternative uh, ports uh, we have in the East Coast, Jacksonville, temporarily to minimize the uh, delay of delivery to the customer. So that is the current outlook and uh, we're looking forward to come back to the uh, port of Baltimore once the operation is back on track. So that's dealing with the finished product, the delivery of those products. As far as making your cars here, are you dealing with any supply chain constraints, the getting supplies and things? Uh, we do have a supply chain issue uh, uh, globally. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a few reasons behind it. Uh, one is the uh, vessel shortages. Um, during pandemic, vessel companies scrapped the old vessels and they are need reinvent to more uh, LNG based, uh, you know, uh, better fuel efficiency and low CO2 vessels. That is one reason. The second reason is uh, just uh, mentioned Suez Canal and, and the Panama Canal uh, uh, is uh, unable to pass through. And the third reason is the significant increase in the export from China mainland. Mm -hmm. 
Now those are contributing to a significant challenge for you know, logistics right now. I, I am curious. I'm glad you brought up China. Most of what they're exporting, though, are they, those are primarily EVs, or, or are they direct competitors to the models that Mazda is producing? It is a combination between battery, pure battery EV, mm -hmm. and the range extender and the internal combustion mm -hmm. engine. It depends on the brand of, or Chinese brand. Mm -hmm. What car do you think will sell the most, EVs, hybrids, or ICEs in the next, say, five years? Uh, I believe still internal combustion engine has really? strong support from the consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, I see a great potential in hybrid. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect solution. Uh, for customers, uh, there is no exa uh, anxiety for range. Uh, right now, it's getting uh, traction right now. Well, we've seen that. I, I'm curious about uh, with the internal combustion engines, because we have seen demand by consumers hold up, but the governments aren't necessarily on the same page. You have uh, major initiatives in the U.S., in Europe, even in China, to, uh, in, in order to re reduce pollution and carbon, the carbon footprint, to get more people to buy electric vehicles or at least alternative fuel vehicles here, mm -hmm. do you not anticipate that those government efforts might push consumers into non-ICE vehicles? Well, consumer gradually uh, will be better educated, but at the moment, uh, infrastructure and, and the battery costs and the price and the affordability, many, many ha very high hurdle uh, for customer to purchase. So it is going to be a slow adaption pace would be expected. Mm -hmm. uh, regulation is one side, a different side. We have to deal with that. Okay. But we focus on the consumer needs and wants and lifestyle. Before we let you go, you're here. You're in the U.S. Are you looking to make an investment in the U.S.? And would you wait until the presidential election is over to make that call? Mm -hmm. We have a couple of uh, alternative plans, but the final decision is after presidential election. On purpose? Uh, no. We need to see you know, uh, it is going to be a big change, would they expected, based upon past experience. I stayed in the U.S., mm -hmm. so it's a big swing. So you don't feel comfortable making that investment until you have that visibility? We do, we do have a plan for the investment in the future, but how and uh, timing uh, to be, you know, waited. All right, Moro San, we really appreciate you taking time for us uh, on your trip here in the U.S. Uh, Masahiro Moro, he's the president and CEO of Mazda. All right, coming up here on the close, the top takeover targets for the second quarter. These could be the potential big movers up ahead. We're going to let you in on the latest results from our survey here at Bloomberg. That's coming up next on the close. This is Bloomberg. All right, Bloomberg has a new survey out. It talks to analysts, brokers, fund managers, and where they're placing their bets on where mergers and acquisition activity will happen this quarter. At the top of the list, Spirit Aero Systems, Avangrid, Macy's, some of the names that are actually being bandied about as likely takeover targets. And of course, a lot of people now moving around that, trying to position around some of those names. Yi Shen Shen is joining us right now, Bloomberg News Equities reporter, to talk a little bit uh, more about this. And uh, let's start off with Spirit, because that's uh, the obvious one sure. that everybody <laughs> wants to know about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, first, thanks for having mm -hmm. me. So this is a survey based on 15 respondents I get from merger of specialists. And I would say Spirit is the most obvious candidate for them, is that we know the background that uh, they, they're exploring options, evaluating bids, and um, and they, uh, lots of ops think that uh, Boeing is the most logic buyer because it is a business that got spin off from Boeing uh, in 2005. And right now, there are quality issues with both sides, both business. So there's an issue needs to be fixed very quickly. Mm -hmm. So a deal will likely happen there. But there's more a question about what will be the terms, what kind of premium the target could get. Exactly. Right? And sort of like what happens with the Airbus stuff and yeah, spirit, right. it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's a very idiosyncratic situation. So I'm wondering what they think about the deal flow so far, mm -hmm. and then overall what the deal flow may look like. Sure. Yeah. So let's say according to the survey, merger ops actually feel that um, the MA rebound so far this year um, is slower than they expected. If you look at the headline number, it's big, like 30 bill, uh, 300 billion actually uh, in the U.S. in first quarter. But if you look closer, a lot of the 
mega deals happen in January, like the Discover Capital One deal, but then that kind of mega deals kind of fizzle out, the momentum fizzle out into March. Um, so the reason that the deal flow seems to be very front loaded and uh, sporty in a way that ops feel is that we still need to see some you know, rate cuts or clear signal of that. Uh, until that being cleared, um, it only with that you know certainty you will see the reopening of financing market yeah. or the return of LBOs, private equity transactions. That's like main part of MA deal making flow. Yeah, still need those lower rates. All right, <laughs> Yishin, thanks very much. Really appreciate it, Yishin Shen, uh, joining us there. See, it all depends on those rate cuts, Romain, and what happens if we don't get it. I mean, again, we were talking about Rafael Bostic talking to Yahoo Finance, saying uh, that you know, sure, if the job market rolls over, maybe we could bring forward their cuts, or we. Have to delay the cuts and push them even further out. It's well, sort of like two ends of a big spectrum. I mean, that just seems like wishful thinking. Even if you get the cuts, what are you talking about? A, a couple, a totally. percentage point? Is that really right. going to change the deal making environment? Maybe. If you can't do, the, if you can't do the deal of five and a quarter, you're not going to do it at what four seventy five. Maybe it's the clarity. Anyway, yeah. we're going to be counting you down to the closing bell with Kara Murphy uh, joining us from Kestra Investment. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Alex Steele. We got 10 minutes until we get to those closing bells. Alex, I don't think the first few hours of trading have been all that exciting. Maybe uh, the last 10 minutes will get better. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. going to be excited. It's going to be so great. It's going to be so exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. No, really, markets are not doing anything. Uh, the S&P is just down by one-tenth of one percent. Royal Caribbean, though, is the worst performing stock in the S&P. I, I really can't find out why. They've had a string of incidences, sure, but... Well, cruise liner doesn't. Uh, real estate is one of the best performing sectors in the S&P, up by 1% uh, as yields go lower. Therefore, those yield proxies uh, do better in the equity market. And financials, kind of the worst, down 7 tenths. I don't know. It's hard to take a real macro takeaway from all the market moves right now. Yeah, a bit of a distorted price action. The S&P is still holding that 5,200 line, but maybe that changes tomorrow when we get the CPI report. Maybe it will make sense for investors. Maybe it will make sense for, well, what the Fed is going to do next when it comes to all the expectations for cutting rates. A little a bit earlier, we started off the show with Michael Remack. He's head of investments for City Global Wealth at Work. Here's what he had to say on that topic. We don't believe that the Fed needs to crush employment in order to move down that path of cutting rates, and that's going to be really important. What we should start to see is a path to 2.5% by the end of this year. That's our view. Mm -hmm. We think we're going to see that flow through with some of the uh, shelter prices, which are a lagging indicator, really starting to make their way into the numbers. Tomorrow uh, could be a, a little bit iffy because we've got oil obviously factoring in. That's going to you know, boost CPI up a bit. But I think overall we see a path to 2.5%, and that's going to give the Fed room to follow through with some of those cuts. And that was the head of investments over at Citi's Wealth at Work, helping us kick off to the close just about an hour ago. Here to help take us to those bells is the chief investment officer at Kestra Investment Management, Kara Murphy, joining us here on the set in New York. Kara? Does the world change tomorrow at 8.30? Well, I think what we're going to mm -hmm. look for is some confirmation that we're mm -hmm. headed in the right direction. You know, if you remember last week, we were waiting for payrolls to tell us whether we had had some weird seasonal adjustments and making numbers too high. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't get that. And so now what doves are going to hope for is for some softer CPI. But I think, honestly, what we're seeing in the market today is that the market is ready for a somewhat disappointing CPI number tomorrow, meaning a little bit higher than what the Fed would expect. Mm -hmm. And if it's okay, we can kind of move on. Yeah. But for the Fed to really cut, they're going to need to see some more confirmation of deceleration. Even if we do get a hot print, though, does that really change the game from an investment perspective? I mean, specifically when it comes to equities, because it seems like so much of what bid up stocks, I mean, obviously some of that was the rate cut expectations, but there was a lot more to it than just that, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. If we look at corporate earnings, yeah. I mean, they've been remarkably strong. We look at GDP estimates. We went from an estimate this yeah. year of 1-2 growth to 2-1. I mean, almost a doubling of what we expected GDP growth. So they're very strong fundamental and underpinning. So yeah, and I'm old I, enough to remember when 2-1, well, that was good. <laughs> right? You know, I like know. Petrich Farm remembers. <laughs> it's yeah. true. So I, I think we're, we still have a lot of momentum yeah. in this economy. Mm -hmm. And if we're just pushing it out a couple of quarters, mm -hmm. I think that's OK. Yeah. Um, there are going to be some areas of the market that are going to be more stung by that. Mm -hmm. But for the broad market, I think we're fine. So how fully invested are you in equities and what do you like? 
We are actually overweight equities right now. Um, earlier this year, we downshifted out of mega caps into more mid caps, a little bit of small caps. So with the idea that we had had a very, very concentrated market last year and that was going to start to broaden out, we've started to see some signs of that. We think that there's still a lot more to go. Uh, well, okay, but then you get the NFIB this morning yeah. that showed that sentiment was the weakest since 2012. They're worried about sales. They're still worried about inflation. So, like, how what, what what's through your stomach like for small caps? So, I think small caps definitely have some headwinds ahead of them. We've seen large caps who have been able to grow corporate profit margins. Earnings have been really strong. A lot of small caps and small businesses, as is reflected in the NFIB, have struggled a little bit more. They're also more rate sensitive. So, this is not to say that small caps are done right and that they have an easier time ahead of them. But expectations have gotten so low for these smaller names that I think there's still a lot of opportunity, even if we don't see a huge reacceleration in their earnings growth. I mean, some of the fear there is that, okay, these aren't the healthiest of companies, at least relative to the larger cap names that have these uh, good balance sheets. And the fear was, okay, we were going to see, you know, defaults and maybe even bankruptcies. That never materialized. But we have seen a little bit of an uptick in some sense of distress. Are you seeing that? A little bit. So when we look at corporate bankruptcies, for Uh instance, last year they were about on par with 2010. So the first time that we really started to see bankruptcies go up. But actually that decelerated in the latter part of the year Mm -hmm. so that um, those smaller companies have been able to find a second win. So yes, there are headwinds, but they've been able to muddle through them. Do you invest in corporate debt right now? And if so, is that investment grade or high yield? So we prefer investment grade. Mm -hmm. Uh, We think there, again, you have the, um, the tailwind of stronger corporate earnings, stronger GDP growth. A lot of those companies are not very sort of uh, reliant on short-term interest rates. Um, On the high yield side, that's where you do have much more indebted companies. Um, And then you also have very, very low spreads. So there's not a lot of room for error. So investment grade looks attractive. So if you're going to dip your toe into value, do you need to sell growth and sell tech to do that? Or do you need to sort of add? Well, if you, if you only have a limited number of dollars, then yes. And it's interesting, too, because if you look at just the core benchmarks today, just by nature of the tremendous outperformance of growth, you have huge overweights and mega caps in growth. Mm-hmm. So even if you started off a year ago with what you thought was a very core portfolio, you really leaned into that growth. So I do think you'd need to start to sell a little bit and come back into growth. What about cyclicals? Thinking like financials and energy, industrials, materials, that kind of stuff. So we think that there are some opportunities. Energy is a really good example where you have valuations running at about half of your 10-year average, um, and you're starting to get a little bit of momentum in the underlying commodity. Um, And with that stronger economic backdrop, you have growing demand. So we actually think that this energy rally has some legs. Financials are a little bit more difficult because the question is, how do we come out of this inverted rate environment? And that is one sector that tends to be fairly politically sensitive, where Democrats versus Republicans might have a very different view of regulatory environment. And mm-hmm. so that could greatly impact those names as well. Does the election, does it have an effect or any kind of chill on the investment decisions? I mean, we were speaking just a few minutes ago with the uh, president and CEO of Mazda, kind of made it clear that from his perspective, corporate investing, that is, that they're kind of putting things on hold until they see the outcome of our election here. For investors in secondary markets, is that something they should be worried about? I think for anyone with a diversified portfolio Mm -hmm. should not be worrying about elections. What we find is that in election years versus non-election years, the S&P 500 return tends to be the same. What is different is how you get there. Typically, those returns tend to be in the back half of the year, and you have a fair amount of volatility in like August, September. Mm -hmm. But it's really important to remember that markets tend to take off actually before the election happens. So you don't want to wait around for the actual event until you buy in. Good point. Great insights. Kara, always great to talk to you and great to have you here in person in Studio 2. Kara Murphy over at Kestra Investment Management, helping us count down to those closing bells. Closing bells just about uh, two and a half minutes away. As we reset here with a market that had been in the red for a good portion of the day, now Getting a bid here closer to the close. Most of the major indices right now in the green. The S&P right now unchanged. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. As we take you to the bell and beyond, Scarlett Fu joining us right now, as she always does at this time here in Studio 2. Our radio colleagues, if you're wondering where they are, uh, you know, yeah, Tim, are Tim and Carol don't work a full five-day week. So we have to we have to give them their break here. But uh, I think uh, the, uh, you know, the trifecta you have here can uh, walk us through. Scarlett, what have you been watching? You know, I've been thinking about the CPI report tomorrow and whether it's going to be a game-changer 
here for equities. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's definitely the bond market is keying off of it. But what we've seen from the equity market is when there's data indicating the economy is strong, the market likes that because it feeds into the idea that earnings will be strong. Mm -hmm. And if the data is weak, well, then that's good, too, because that means the Federal Reserve may actually have room to cut rates. So for equities, it seems like it's going to be good no matter what. I'm actually looking at the 10 year uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow. We have an auction tomorrow at one o'clock, uh, $39 billion. The three year today was a little bit soft and go very well, despite the fact that there was buying kind of all across the curve. I think that that could be kind of interesting, particularly after that CPI. I, actually, the bond market has actually been encouraging because you think about this sort of re-rating of Fed of rate expectations mm -hmm. and that you would actually think that rates uh, that the uh, bond rates would be actually be higher than where they are right now. I mean, you still got a 10 year holding mm -hmm. at four, four, the two years at what, four, seven, four, eight or something, four, seven and four right now. And so you would think with all the hullabaloo around that the disinflationary trend has been broken, I think it would be like over 5% by now. Well, we have a lot of what data yeah. points yes, before agree. the yeah. June FOMC meeting. Mm -hmm. And that's when if the Fed does cut anytime soon, that'll be the meeting at which it happens. So yeah. this CPI report that's coming up is one of three data points that may or may do not think, do anything. Do you think Jay Powell can sell that, though? I mean, there's been so much talk about how he really wants to start in June. I mean, no one knows that for sure, but that's a scuttle. But, mm -hmm. but as we've heard from Rafael Bostic today and other Fed members, they're clearly in the camp of let's just wait a little bit longer. So I wonder what that conversation is going to be like when we get to uh, the days ahead of that June meeting. Whatever the discussion, he's yeah. going to make it sound as boring as possible when he does talk to everyone about it. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> yep, that's the goal. <laughs> that is the goal. But guys, going back to CPI, do you get this? Do you see this cool note? Uh, 22V research shows that 53% of investors think that the reaction to tomorrow will be risk on. So I don't know what that tells us. I mean, 53%. Okay. But like, does that mean that we're set up for disappointment or does that mean that we risk on no matter what to Scarlett's point? Well, I think everybody is really just on edge right now for that blowout number, the idea that it comes in really hot. So yeah. if you get a number that's in line or maybe a slight tick above, then at least it's like, okay, there's no reason to Let's panic. move on. But, uh, we're going to find out, of course, the team surveillance will have full coverage of that, 8.30 a.m. Washington time. Meanwhile, here in New York, team the close, 4 p.m., we get the closing bells. Dow Jones Industrial Average It's going to finish the day. We're just going to call it unchanged, 38.883, down about nine points on the day. The S&P 500 higher, uh, a big flip-flop here. It had been in the red for a good portion of the day. It's going to close above that 5,200 level, up eight points or about a tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq up three-tenths of a percent on the day. And your relative outperformer, just by a schmidge, that's going to go to the Russell 2000, a seven-point gain or three-tenths of a percent. Yeah, and if you look at the IMAP that shows uh, what the sector's breakdown looks like, um, it was a lot more mixed before. Plenty of green here. There's 11 sectors, only two in the red. Industrials and financials. Uh, financials losing half of 1% before the big banks report earnings on Friday. Industrials down about a fifth of 1%. In terms of the big gainers, uh, real estate investment trusts gaining 1.3%. Utilities up half of a percent along with consumer staples. And uh, right now, we want to walk you through some of the big uh, gainers and decliners here on the day. Joining us right now is Bailey Lipschultz, covers cross assets for us here at Bloomberg. Bailey, what are you watching? Yeah, starting with the stocks that ended the green, as we mentioned, the S&P eking out a gain. Moderna up more than 6% this coming after positive results from a drug study of their vaccine, cancer vaccine, in combination with Merck's Keytruda, showing some strong results, albeit very early, and head and neck cancer really showing that maybe they can be more than just a COVID play, and that really has been long the bull case for investors uh, of the stock. Granted, it's still down about 70% from those uh, all-time highs back in 2021. Also want to look at Lucid Group. Really not that much higher, but still ending the day in the green. This coming after first quarter deliveries and production matching expectations. Uh, there has been a lot of bearish sentiment around the EV space. For Lucid, around. that's pretty good, I should point out, well, right? I mean, I mean, like it, matching is pretty good. A match <laughs> is a beat when you're down, what, 40% year to date or yeah. in the last 12 months, 66% in the last 12 months, Alex. So. Again, though, 2.3%, nothing really gangbusters. So seeing some gains for the company that once was far larger, much like Moderna, two of those mm -hmm. uh, big pandemic winners. And NVIDIA, Scarlett, you mentioned it. Uh, risk off sentiment, maybe a smidge ahead of the mm -hmm. CPI day tomorrow. If we do see the market move higher, Really, NVIDIA has been the leader there. So that's one of the big things that we've seen. Maybe some investors taking some chips off the table. That was the biggest drag on the S&P 500 today. And one stock that was just within uh, spitting distance of one of uh, its worst close since December 2022. Boeing, worst close since October 2023. This coming after that whistleblower report. Whistleblower saying that the company took shortcuts to speed their 787 assembly, that they improperly fixed gaps in the fuselage parts, down more than 30% year to date. Not a good day, not a good year so far for no, Boeing. It's kind of ugly on that front. Also, didn't um, Intel wind up 
Before I get deals, didn't Intel wind up unveiling a chip too? Could that be part of the NVIDIA thing or are they kind of separate? Yeah, <laughs> NVIDIA was lower than before was yeah. the big thing that we were looking at. It seemed more like an Intel story trying to get into the AI flavor. Well, that's why, yeah, when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's something new. Yeah. And then when you, did, you kind of dove really. into it, it was like, okay, this is sort of like, you know, I feel like it's like the Elon Musk trick. It's like, you know, when something goes wrong, just say robo taxis and, you know, everybody, everything's And for back that one day, it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for every company that makes semiconductors or does anything that requires semiconductors, the, the winning thing to say is, we're going to develop our own or we're going to start looking at it ourselves because we don't want to be reliant on an external producer. I've, told, I've been told that developing that was, it takes a lot of money. And, and I was going to say, yeah. unless I spend a boatload yeah. of yes. money, maybe like <laughs> half a boat. Okay, I'm taking a look at the bond market. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, all yields pretty much on offer here. Uh, you have the two-year yield down by about five basis points, the 10-year yield down six. As I've been talking about uh, throughout the morning is that uh, the three-year bond auction was kind of meh, didn't really do much. We get the 10-year tomorrow, we get the 30-year uh, on Thursday as well. But again, what perplexes me, guys, is gold at a record high. Did you guys see that? Another Mm -hmm. record high today. Mm -hmm. Bank of America now sees 3,000 announced by 2025. Something doesn't square right with the move that we're seeing in the bond market and then gold. I think that's been the kind of the story overall across yeah. asset wise. You look at what's happening with gold, you look at what's happening with oil, you pair that with what's happening in the bond market and in equities. And it kind of gets us uh, to this, uh, to the big CPI report tomorrow here. I mean, we talk about what's the expectation, 0.3% on a month to month basis mm -hmm. here. So that's not huge, but if we do get that, is it off to the races? And I don't know, Bailey, I mean, you've been keeping an eye on what's been going on in the market. Are people kind of primed for an upside surprise in this? It seems that yeah. way, but the big focus still is on earnings season on Friday. So we do get a solid data point, all things considered, and trying to gauge where the Fed's next move is. But what's Jamie Dimon going to say on Friday? How is that going to help set the tone mm -hmm. of earnings season? Because we are going into a critical point in time where markets are trading and kind of the ability for companies to deliver on these expectations, Scarlett. And the estimates are fairly low for this first quarter batch of earnings, right? I believe it's something in the neighborhood of 3.9% um, EPS growth, which would be the slowest since 2021 one or 2022 but the slowest in a couple of years of course that happened heading into the last earnings season and the numbers blew out those estimates so um, perhaps the bar is low for a reason here Yes, yeah. maybe the bar is low uh, for a reason. But weren't we talking yesterday that like uh, the tech companies are supposed to deliver really good earnings growth now, but then 2025 is when it's, like later on it's going to get really bad. So then you got to rotate and all that. But then Bailey, you, you cover all the IPOs and the meme stock craze. Like that part of the market doesn't necessarily tell you that we're phasing out here. Well, the weird thing with covering meme stocks and you know the Trump media's or even like people were wanting to call Reddit a meme stock, which I completely disagree with. Uh, the big thing is that I've seen on any given day, those stocks outperform. The market can be lagging, but you look at and talk to some of these fast money traders, they need to generate alpha. Yeah. So if the market's selling off or it's a sleepy day, what better way than to use something like uh, this closed end fund DXYZ, Destiny Tech 100, was up 1,000% in two weeks, dropped 40% today because it's an easy way to flip shares and try to generate some returns. How much of the price action, though, can we really sort of take at face value? I mean, it seems like we've seen the volume lighter, even the churn is lighter, and there's been a lot of talk how a lot of the trades really aren't coming from the institutional side, at least not to the degree that we would expect them to come. No, and I think that's yeah. the big question is who's buying yeah. and where does that come from? We've seen retail really step in and we've seen whether it's hedge funds maybe just paring back some of these purchases, yeah. but there still is the whole argument about uh, money market funds and that mm. cash on the sidelines needing to be pulled oh, in. Oh, cash on the sidelines. Whether it happens Scarlett or not. Scarlett does not believe you on this, by the where, way. Where, where have, you, have, you, have, you seen, have you been say. to the sidelines, Scarlett? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen this? Scarlet? We have Alex? stuff in the sidelines. I've seen yes. the wall of $6.6 6 trillion. You've seen the wall? Yes. Okay, great. It's, it's, it's pretty formidable. Can you just like pull something out there and throw it into the market for us? No, that wall won't move. That's the problem. But if we use that as like an indicator, like what, what, you're assuming that that money is money that belongs to stocks, right? But what if that's just money that's your savings that you're just not keeping in a bank? Right. You're not going to move that into stocks. You're going to keep it someplace where it's not doing anything and then it makes money. And that sort of disrupts that whole thesis. And people have gotten used to the idea that their money makes money just sitting there. And yeah. it's going to be hard to give that up. I was so offended when Marcus sort of uh, reduced its rate by 10 basis points. I thought the same exact <laughs> I like, thing. What? I hated that email. I was like, by the way, <laughs> the congrats. Didn't cut rates. Why would you do 10 this? basis points? But I was like so upset about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it gets to the idea, though, too, is like once we get to get the earnings and with the bank starting on Friday here, uh, is that going to be a macro story or is it going to be something much more individual to the markets? No, and I think, well, that's why I think it's so interesting to see what the heads of big banks say, because they have the best line of sight into how the consumer is doing and what actually is happening under the surface. Yes, it's all fun and games to talk about what NVIDIA is going to deliver and Apple will because they're juggernauts. But how is the consumer holding up? And that's really what I like to look for when we have Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan really kicking off earnings. Season. You know what I want to know from Jamie Dimon? 
is how long can he hold a plank? <laughs> okay. Did you guys not see this New York Post no. article? 50-year-old woman, five kids, 12 grandkids, held a plank for four hours and 30 minutes plus. Okay, to be fair, she practices this regularly. She, she planks for three hours at a time every day. She um, studies for her master's degree while she's doing this. She watches Netflix. While she's doing the class? She's 58 and had five I know. kids. Do you know what she's repair that is to your done. core when you have to do that five times? Uh, no, I hate this person. I don't know her, but I hate her. <laughs> no, I love her. I want to meet her. All right, You're my we're, hero. We're going to say goodbye uh, to Bailey. Appreciate him jumping on here uh, on the close. They'll break down everything happening in the markets here on the day as we push beyond uh, into uh, uh, the next uh, segment of the show here. Stick with us. A conversation coming up about the potential moves that we could see in the markets tomorrow. Jay Barry, JP Morgan's co head of U8 Strategy, is on deck. This is the close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic. And I think I'm going to steal a phrase from Alex Seal about the markets today, Scarlett, and that's it could have been worse. <laughs> we actually opened higher for most of the major indices today, but for a good portion of the session, we were in the red. And this looked like one of those days where we were really going to hit the floor. But we saw a bid come into this market late in the day as a lot of people really starting to position around that CPI report tomorrow. An S&P that closed out the day at that 5,200 level, and that really has been the line in the sand, only up fractionally. The Russell 2000 got a pretty decent bid, up about three tenths of a percent on the day. But take a look at yields here. That could change in a big way tomorrow morning. 4.7 right now on your two-year yield. And that could have an effect here on riskier assets as well, including in the crypto space like Bitcoin. A few big individual movers out there on the day, Scarlett, but not the names they would normally look to. Where are the NVIDIAs? Where are the Apples? Where are the Metas? You know, they're on? not in the headlines yeah. today. We're paying attention to Cisco. This is one of the better performers in the uh, Dow Industrials. And this is after Morgan Stanley resumed coverage of the internet gear maker with an overweight rating, saying that while there may not be a catalyst for a positive earnings revision in the next quarter or two, uh, the stock is trading at or near a record discount to the S&P 500. So on valuation reasons alone, maybe it's time to bid up Cisco. The other name I'm paying attention to is Royal Caribbean, down about 3.7%, uh, falling the most since early January of 2024. There's been a string of negative headlines. There was a passenger who jumped overboard on one of its ships, another passenger who went missing during a stop in Mexico. Certainly, this is not encouraging. And then the company refunding $1.3 million to passengers who had booked trips that were canceled because of COVID. So a lot of these negative headlines weighing on the stock, and we've seen a, a bit of weakness here. Now, our top story of this hour is one that we'll revisit uh, throughout the show, and that is investors waiting for the big data point of this week. Tomorrow's release of the Consumer Price Index will play a key role in helping determine whether the Federal Reserve moves forward with a rate cut in June. The fear is that after two straight months of hotter than expected prints, the March CPI report will continue to be a thorn in the Fed's side. Remain? Yeah, and a lot of opinions really flying around about what that's going to mean for the Fed's rate path. State Street forecasting 150 basis points of easing this year? Yeah. And former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, he's saying he only sees three rate cuts as the base case. Here in studio with us to give us his insights is Jay Barry. He's the co-head of U.S. Rate Strategy at J.P. Morgan. All right, Jay, you know, this has been the parlor game all year long as to how many rate cuts we get. I know no one really knows here. But when you look at some of the repositioning, if you will, that we've seen in the bond market, what is that telling you? I think it tells you that the priors we had to start the year, Romain, have been completely challenged. I think market participants came in this year saying that the disinflation we saw in the second half of last year was likely to continue. And when it didn't, it sort of challenged the notion at the start of the year that the Fed would not only be easing early and potentially in March, mm -hmm. but often and more aggressively than other central banks. So I think more of your active investors who had been positioned for that to start the year have paired it back. And that's probably contributed to why we've repriced yields so much higher this year as we have. And are you surprised that yields aren't higher than where they are right now? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think from a baseline perspective, mm -hmm. we are looking for three cuts this year, beginning in July, actually. And markets are priced for about two plus for this year. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at long term yields through the lens of how the market is pricing Fed policy, inflation and growth, it would actually seem to suggest to us that they're probably about 20 to 25 basis points too high. So mm -hmm. as long as we're in an environment where we think the next move from the Fed is an ease, I don't think yields should be considerably higher than they are right now. Mm -hmm. But the big question here is, of course, what happens tomorrow and what happens with the growth outlook as well. 
You mentioned you still see three rate cuts, which is what the Fed sees as well, except just starting later mm -hmm. perhaps than um, what many people had thought. Is the election going to be, prove to be a sticky problem here in terms of timing and how the Fed moves with that? Um, not from a primary perspective, Scarlett, but I think from a secondary or tertiary perspective, it can. I think first and foremost, you know, the path to easing is going to be dictated by what happens with inflation over the next few months. And we've heard from the chair a number of times that a strong labor market doesn't forestall rate cuts, but a weak labor market can bring them forward. So there's a lot more being priced into what happens tomorrow. And I think that will be the key sort of figure to watch. But if the pace of disinflation becomes more halting mm -hmm. and we're considering rate cuts closer to the election itself, it's possible that it could play a role just from an optical perspective, because it's possible the Fed may not want to be seen lowering rates just before a decision like that. But I don't think it's the story for now. Right. And, and speaking of disinflation, you've noted that um, we've seen medium term inflation expectations rising. And that's kind of similar to what we saw last fall, mm -hmm. except this time around, it's being driven by broad increases in commodity prices, mm -hmm. oil, gold, all, cocoa, for that matter. Does that make the rise that we're seeing inflation expectations this year more or less pernicious? I think less pernicious, to be quite honest, because last fall, long-term inflation expectations were rising. And, you know, we like to think about five-year, head five-year inflation expectations as being the anchor, mm -hmm. not just for nominal rates, but for monetary policy and its efficacy and its credibility. Now it's more of a short-term move. So long-term inflation expectations haven't moved up as aggressively, not becoming unanchored and probably less of a concern for the Fed than they were long-term last fall. Uh, another area that we kind of came into this year concerned about, or at least talking about, was all the Treasury issuance mm -hmm. that we were going to get and what type of impact that would have. We've seen, we've had a few auctions this year. Some are, were a little sloppy, but overall they were taken okay here. Uh, how have you felt about the reception and what that may pretend for future auctions going forward? I mean, so far, I think the results yeah. have been pretty solid this yeah. year, Romain, and in large part because if we think the next move is an ease, there's going to be support from mm. bond funds, insurance companies, pension funds, hedge mm -hmm. funds for treasuries. Mm -hmm. Last fall, it was a concern because markets were still considering the likelihood the Fed could tighten again, mm -hmm. and there was this surge of long-duration issuance coming from the Treasury. Now we're at a point where, at least for the time being, auction sizes are stable. You think the next move is an ease, so that probably means auctions should be well-absorbed outside of days like tomorrow in which we've got a 10-year auction just before the CPI report. Is there any worry? And I know, look, I mean, we're the number one market, and we have been, and we'll probably continue to be for quite some time. But is there any concern about competition uh, from other countries, the idea that Japan's finally starting mm -hmm. to lift its rates? So now maybe that differential isn't as wide, and maybe that makes it a little bit more attractive for investors not uh, to uh, buy U.S.? I think it's a normalization yeah. because you've had normalization of policy elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it means that the Treasury market is shifting from kind of price insensitive hands like the Fed and foreign investors and mm -hmm. banks to asset managers, pension funds, insurance companies, hedge funds. And mm -hmm. maybe that requires more compensation. Mm -hmm. Maybe it requires a steeper curve. Um, and it will kind of mean, you know, all is equal. You need to have a bit more premium built in before you can buy U.S. fixed income, but we think it's it's going to be fine in the context of a Fed that's likely easing later this year. One phrase we heard a lot last year was term premium, and you don't hear that popping up this mm -hmm. time around as yields continue to rise. Why is that? And is that because fiscal sustainability questions are not an issue in an election year, mm -hmm. but they will be in 2025? Well, I'm, nothing's changed on the deficit front, right? We're still running a deficit that's a 6% share of GDP. I think what has changed is last fall, it was an open-ended series of increases to long-duration auction sizes from the Treasury mm -hmm. at a time when we were still thinking about tightening that made it difficult to digest. Now, both of those are not at play if we think the next move is a cut and for the time being if Treasury is well-positioned with respect to its auction schedule. So for the time being, I think the term premium story in the context of what Romain asked about and yeah. the shift in investors is a slowly evolving story, not this sort of supercharged one that we had last fall when both of these things were working together at the same time. Context is everything. It always is. All right, Jay, really appreciate your joining us today. Jay Barry is co-head of U.S. Rate Strategy over at J.P. Morgan. He still sees three rate cuts just starting a little bit later in July. Coming up, we've got the top three where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. 
Context changes everything. It is time now for the top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Richard Branson. The British billionaire's net worth has fallen by roughly half since mid-2022 to about $3 billion. And remain that's mainly a result of steep declines in shares of his companies that went public through those blank check companies through SPACs. Yeah, I mean, he devoted a lot of his uh, cash to that. And at least at the time, it seemed like a pretty good mm -hmm. deal for him. Uh, he rode that wave higher. But as you, of course, we've seen that SPAC, uh, the bloom has come off the SPAC rose here. Absolutely. And he's hurting, at which point, I, and by hurting, you know, he's still worth, you know, like what, three or four billion dollars or something? Yeah, about three billion. So, but at his peak, his yeah. fortune was worth about almost $8 billion, so okay. well, it's I a mean, big drop-off. You know, yeah, it's a big drop-off. I, I don't know. It doesn't change his lifestyle. Probably <laughs> you know, not. I mean, that's one less, one less space flight that he can take or something like that. Um, you know, I, I was that, that story really grabbed my attention. Another story that grabbed my attention, and we've had him on this program, Mark Smucker. He's the CEO of J.M. Smucker, mm -hmm. and as his name would imply, uh, he is a Skyon, of course, uh, of the founding family. And he had an interview with Fortune where he talked a lot about what it took for him to rise to that job. Now, of course, the big takeaway from this and the big headline everybody is putting out there is Mark Smucker says he's no Nepo baby. And he talks, uh, goes on and on about, you know, how he really had to buy for this job. And, I, I, you know, if you get past the headline, there's an argument to be made that, yeah, he really did put in some work uh, to get to where he is. Sure. Of course, we should also point out that uh, I can't remember the last time someone not named Smucker hasn't run this mm -hmm. company. Yeah, no, yeah. It's a, he said he had to prove himself to earn a seat at the table, except, of course, it's totally different when your last name is the same as the name of the company, right? Yeah. I mean, he got in, and yes, he had to prove that he could make it to the top, but yeah. he got in. Yeah, that's there's sort the hard of part. inevitability to yes. it, right? Like yes. the journey, yeah, you might have to, you know, show that you have the chops, but at the end of the day, it wasn't like you weren't getting the job. No, and he also said there <laughs> yeah. are some rules uh, to yeah. working at Smuckers, right? You have to have work. Uh, you have to have worked outside the company, get that outside experience. You also mm -hmm. have to graduate degree. So yeah. check, check. I'm yeah, check, those. check, and you know, and that's fine. He inherited the job from his uncle. Uh, his uncle inherited from. He earned uh, the job. Earned the job. Yes. Excuse me. So, uh, I mean, look, I mean, he's obviously a capable CEO. I don't think anyone's going to take that away from him. But everyone focusing in on, I'm not a nepo baby. Yeah, well, yeah. nepo baby is a, yeah. a fun phrase. Yeah. All right, the last person I'm watching is Martin Eberhard. He's the former CEO of Tesla. He tells Bloomberg it's a shame that Tesla may have abandoned its cheap car. He also weighed in on the broader EV market. Take a listen. In the, in the long run. What wins in the automotive space is, is a combination of, of quality and price. If you're driving for these two, these two features, that's, that's who wins. But, but I think it's important to understand that the automotive space is not like Silicon Valley in the sense that this is not a space where there's a winner-take-all technolo winner technology, right? We, we, we can have a dozen different car companies around the world making a do dozen different types of cars meeting the different positions in the market all succeeding. It's not like with computer operating systems. And to that end, he said Tesla giving up on a cheap car makes it harder for it to compete with uh, low-end Chinese EV makers. And uh, he says that seems like a better market than perhaps that gigantic truck that they currently make. Yeah, and you should listen to him. He's not just a former CEO who actually founded this company. Uh, he was there before Elon Musk, and we should point out he was kind of forced out because he had a difference of opinion with uh, mm -hmm. Elon Musk at the time, and uh, Musk got control over it and obviously took this company to great heights, but they had very different visions back yeah. then, and it's clear that even today <laughs> they kind of had diverging visions as well. But it's actually good to hear from him. You know, we, we focus so much on Elon Musk, but we kind of forget there are a lot of other people in this EV ecosystem mm -hmm. who have opinions as well, and, uh, you know, whether anyone will listen to him will remain to be seen. Yeah, it must be yeah. tough to be Tesla's co-founder and former CEO. Yeah, I mean, he made a decision to leave. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he couldn't have stayed, but he clearly just couldn't work uh, with Elon. And, you know, they've, you know, he's done well in his life. I, I don't, again, I don't, I don't, really I don't think he's complaining. Yeah. 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 Well, in the last few minutes, yeah. we also learned that Jessica Alba is stepping down as the chief creative officer of the company that she helped co-found, which is the Honest Company. Uh, she's going to move on and do some other creative things, according to the statement. But um, this company stock, uh, HNST is the ticker, uh, is down in after hours trading uh, following Alba's uh, announcement. Yeah, and that company, I mean, the stock has been on the back foot uh, for a while now. It's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I don't know 
does it matter? I mean, on one hand, yeah, she might have been the creative vision to get this the thing face. started. But at the end of the day, you're supposed to kind of hand this off to the more seasoned executives and let them run things. So if this was set up properly, mm -hmm. then maybe this could be a good thing. Who knows? Maybe she, or maybe she was the driving force behind everything. We're going to find out. I guess investors are concerned, and that's why it's down 3%. But what you point out, it's a fraction of its IPO price. That's, that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. Succession issues are always top of mind for all these uh, founder-run companies. I'm not saying she ran it, but she certainly was the face of it for a very long oh, time. Oh, absolutely. And let's face it. I mean, we wouldn't have been talking about Donald's mm -hmm. company if it weren't Jessica Alba uh, at the helm there. Very well said. Uh, all right. Uh, when we come back after the break, we're going to take a look back on this day in history. And Scarlett, we're going to take a look at the OG of meme stocks. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this. I felt old in the meeting pitching this today. The music <laughs> CD subscription service, k I'm old enough. It tried and failed to adapt to the internet age, and it created one of the most spectacular rises and falls in stock market history. The question before we go to break, what was the best-selling k CD of all time? Ooh, a 90s <laughs> band for sure. This is Bloomberg. All right, on this day back in 1998, the music service k best known for those disco compilation record and CDs that you saw advertised on late night TV back in the 70s and 80s, instead it was actually gonna launch an online music service. In the span of about just a few days, the shares which had languished at less than $4 each for years became the ultimate meme stock of the day. It was fitting for a company that had actually made its name and fortune on marketing hype. Founded back in 1962 by a former door-to-door -door salesman named Phil Alcuvis, k started off hawking non-stick frying pans and kitchen gadgets such as the Vegomatic. Loud commercials with the famous tagline like, wait, there's more, were the backdrop for pushing dozens of products, many with questionable uses. There was the patty stacker, the miracle brush, the bonsai blade, the pocket fisherman. Most of those, though, k didn't actually make. Instead, they were supplied by Ron Popeil. He eventually severed ties with Kivas and became his own pitch man. And that forced k to consider other product lines. It struck gold after Kibes assembled the rights to thousands of outdated songs and put them on compilations albums, like Disco Mania, 20 Great Truck Driving Songs, and its most successful CD ever, the Hooked on Classic series, which was basically just the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra playing Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms to a disco backbeat. It was a wild success, but eventually it ran into a wall in the 1990s when consumers began gravitating to internet-based music services. k announcement on this day in 1998 that it would enter the online music space created a frenzy. The shares almost doubled in the first trading day after the announcement to $9 a share. Volume jumped to more than 55 times its daily average, and within two weeks, the stock was above 40 bucks. And just like that, Mean stocks of the day, it was a trade that was driven mostly by retail investors. The average trade size at the time was around 500 shares. It was a phenomenal run for a stock that unfortunately wasn't supported by any comparable increase in revenue or profitability. Just seven months after that initial stock pop, the bubble did burst with the stock plunging 43% in two days after k told investors it faced a delisting because its net tangible assets, only of about 450,000, were way too low. Executive departures and insider share sales only compounded the situation. And finally, by August of 2000, the shares had fallen more than, from more than $40 a share to less than two. The Nasdaq delisted the stock, and seven months later, in March 2001, k -Tail's primary business here in the U.S. filed to liquidate under bankruptcy protection. Now, the company still lives on as a closely held company, and it does have a big back catalog of at least 200,000 songs that generates revenue today, though much smaller, if you will, and the success of decades past is certainly no more. Scarlett? I can even picture the commercials, and I used to sit there and watch through them, the whole thing, and, but wait, there's more. You know, that, that whole ethos was very much part of uh, the business model there. All right, let's talk about business models and small businesses in particular, because optimism among small businesses dropped to a more than 11 month, 11 year low, I should say, last month. That's according to the latest report from the NFIB. Bloomberg's Simone Foxman joins us now with more. So what did the survey indicate that small businesses were most concerned about? Really volume of sales. So those talking about lower profit expectations, 29% said they were worried about weaker sales. Then beyond that, it was uh, prices. The rise in materials costs, about 17% of, of those owners said that was part of it. it. Interestingly enough, you know, to the extent that this is sales volume, though those business owners who did say they ex actually expect profits to rise, they, half of them said it was because of volume of sales. So 
So um, the inflation story is here, and yeah. frankly, 25% of business owners said it's the single most important problem in their business. Mm -hmm. But you still got to get people into your store uh, and you know doing business with you. Has this affected their outlook on hiring? Yeah, we got some data from NFIB as mm -hmm. well last week. Um, 11% expect to add workers in the next three months. That's the fourth decline in a row. But at the same time, 37% they say they have jobs they can't fill. Um, so this is playing in in terms of input costs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also playing in in terms of how how businesses can actually afford to hire people. If they have to pay people more, uh, then that's a challenge. Yeah. They're really feeling the impacts of this unemployment rate at 3.8%. The economists you've spoken to, I mean, what are their, what's been their reaction to this? Well, we've had some of them here on mm -hmm. uh, Bloomberg TV. Mohamed mm -hmm. El Arian was on and talking about how inflation is sticky and that's not, shouldn't stop the Fed. Mm -hmm. um, we had Wells Fargo come out as well as economists there talking about how they believe that small business optimism is going to remain suppressed mm -hmm. in part because of the stickiness. So I think when we look ahead to the inflation data that we're supposed to get tomorrow, yeah. even if we see a good reading, it doesn't mean that that's what people are actually feeling, business owners are actually feeling in the economy. Yeah, absolutely. Simone Foxman, and I'll, you talk about all the economists we've spoken to on this program today. We have one more here on tap, and we saved the best for last. Sarah Wolf, senior U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley, joining us right now with all eyes on that inflation report tomorrow morning. Sarah, I mean, everyone seems to be on edge. I think we're going to get a really hot print here. What are you expecting? It's a big inflation print mm -hmm. tomorrow. The Fed needs to see a bit more data in order for them to cut in June. So if we get a hot CPI report, it definitely takes June possibly off the table. It's not the convincing data that they need to see. We have core CPI 0.25. Whatever we get for CPI, though, we do need to wait for PPI on Thursday because mm -hmm. we get medical services, financial services, airfares. That gives us a full picture of what core PCE inflation is going to be for March, which is really the Fed's measure. Right now, we're looking for 0.22 for core PCE in March and in April, and that, to us, is enough good data for the Fed to cut in June. Mm. So to what extent does CPI, PPI, and core PCE tell the same story when it comes to inflation? So CPI, we get a decent chunk of what we're going to get for PCE, right? It's everything that consumers pay for. Mm -hmm. PPI is things that get paid for on behalf of consumers. So it's a smaller part, but medical services can carry quite a bit of weight for PCE. The one thing I will say is that shelter, that comes from CPI, and that's probably the biggest and most important component to look at right now for the Fed. Shelter inflation has been very sticky, and they want to see that come down. We're looking for that component to step down from about 0.46 to 0.4, so a little bit of progress. But we have to look in the details, even if we get, you know, a 0.2 on core CPI. But if there's a reacceleration in shelter inflation, that's actually not going to feel so good for the Fed. So those are the components. I'm wondering what's driving it, because we've seen that the normalization of supply kinks has really helped drive the slowdown in inflation, brought us closer to that 2 percent target. But now with evidence that the economy is doing just fine, demand accounts um, for the fact that inflation is no longer slowing, that that demand impulse is pushing inflation, you know, to, to stay at current levels, if not pick up a little bit more. Talk through that balance there. So we've been focusing a lot on the supply side of the economy because we think that there's been a massive supply side shock in 2023, and that's going to carry into 2024, and it's coming through stronger population growth. We got about 3.3 million immigrants into the country in 2023. The numbers look like this year's also going to be strong. And off of that, you know, more supply creates more demand. Um, and what we've seen is if you look back into 2023, we had 3% real GDP, non-farm payrolls, 250,000 a month. The unemployment rate still moved up, which indicates that break-even payrolls were higher than 250,000 a month. And we had disinflation. So this just goes to show that, yes, we do have a lot more demand in the, in the economy. And it's likely that potential GDP in the near term is higher than the 1.8% we keep talking about. Yeah. Um, but the Fed is going to be OK with strong demand as long as we continue to see labor supply yeah. come back. I am curious on the labor supply, particularly when it comes to immigration. I've seen a lot of people talk about the gains that we've made in the labor market and how so much of that actually has been driven 
by immigration. Is that true? It's incredibly yeah. true. So if we go back to 2022, we had about a million uh, net immigration of about a million into the country. Mm. That jumped up to 3.3 million. Mm. And so the CBO put out a bunch of estimates that we've checked ourselves, and it basically rose population growth by almost 80 basis points last mm. year. Significant difference. And if you kind of back out a rule of thumb, when you have about a one percentage point increase in population growth, that could translate to anywhere between a 0.7 to a full one percentage point increase and potential GDP. I ask that too because if we didn't have that, let's say the immigration policy was a little stricter as some people would have liked, what do you think the effect would have been uh, on inflation, on wage pressures, all these things that we've been tearing our hair out over? It's still really early days, yeah. but we've been doing some work looking at the disinflationary impact of immigration. And because the labor market has been so tight and immigration has been a critical part of labor supply coming back, um, and also creating more slack in the way in the labor market, helping bring nominal wages down. It has played a role, we think, in the disinflationary process. So the Fed probably would have been more focused on bringing growth and payrolls down more significantly, creating more slack in order to reach their inflation outcomes. But now there's been a, a rethink of how strong the economy could mm -hmm. be because of this supp these supply side dynamics. How well understood is the effect of this increase in immigration on all of our economic data? Because companies are very reluctant to talk about this out loud for fear of political backlash. It's something that they just don't want to go touching at all or even go near. So we're not hearing from them any of the anecdotal, but it's clearing, clearly showing up in the data that is compiled officially. I'll answer that as an economist and what we could see in the data. What we could see is if you look at the, February, the payroll report that we got on Friday, 303 non-farm payrolls, the unemployment rate moved down three basis points from 3.86 mm -hmm. to 3.83. Participation was up wages were down. What does that tell you? We can absorb a lot more jobs in the economy. It's not coming that much from the current population re-entering the labor force. So we know that. We know that it's coming from immigration in part because that's just what the data is showing us. You could track the immigration flows on a high frequency basis. So our economy, Powell said it himself, it's bigger, but it's not necessarily tighter. All right, well said, Sarah. Really appreciate your joining us. Sarah Wolf of Morgan Stanley. And I bring up that point about how companies are fairly reluctant to talk about this. They don't want to be on the front lines in terms of saying one way or another how it helps their business or hurts their yeah, business in any yeah, way. Yeah, it's a sensitive topic, as you know. But that's why I was like, when I, when I kind of heard a couple of people talking about this, I never really looked at that data. Mm -hmm. And then when you look it up, it's like, oh, wow, this has really been a big driver. And I mean, it's, it's been a benefit. Yes. And, and, and like I said, it's kind of aided, I think, to a lot of extent, uh, what Jay Powell has been trying to do. Yeah, but it, it's... Insofar as economists are talking about it, but companies themselves who are oh, seeing the yeah. direct impact, they're not talking about no, it. And no, therefore, and I, I wonder how much consumers really understand it as well. No, yeah, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. All yeah. right. Um, right now, we're looking at a market that uh, managed to finish higher uh, when it comes to the S&P 500, just marginally, up by one-tenth of one percent. We also saw buying in treasuries uh, pushing the yield down on the 10-year to 4.35 percent. Of course, there's still another big auction tomorrow. Gold futures remain continue to make record highs, nine tenths of one percent higher for gold. Yeah, this is about this is kind of the conundrum too. And I thought that Bloomberg had a great piece a, a few days ago, just kind of about who's really buying, mm -hmm. uh, because we keep talking about it in the context, oh, this is the inflation trade, right, or the, the expectations on what the Fed may or may not do. And you know, our reporters are basically saying, no, it's a lot more complicated than that. And then of course you have all the physical buying that China is doing, seventeen yes. straight months that they've been boosting their reserves for who knows what reasons. So. There's going to be a lot to yeah. unpack there, especially because ETF flows into gold uh, ETFs are definitely coming out. So oh, that's, yeah, that's how, how do you make sense of all of this, right? Institutional buy. Okay. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Microsoft said to be investing almost $3 billion in data centers in Japan, according to the Nikkei. It comes ahead of a meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Kishida tomorrow. Joining us now from Washington is Bloomberg Balance of Power co-host Joe Matthew. And Joe, this kind of deal is what you'd expect to happen before a big summit between the leaders of two countries. And it's meant to kind of underscore the strength of the U.S.-Japanese uh, relationship when it comes to uh, business ties and, and investments, right? Yeah. 
Well, that's absolutely right. And it follows Microsoft's uh, meeting with Kishida here in Washington uh, today. So that announcement, $2.9 billion, is the biggest investment Microsoft has made in Japan. And you're right. Kishida is encouraging investment in Japan as part of this visit to Washington. Is going to be sitting down with Joe Biden tomorrow. Uh, and, of course, they have an enormous amount in common, a lot of issues of overlap. But defense is going to be a major focus as they talk about strengthening our alliance, plans to create a council on defense industries that would allow the two countries to collaborate on military projects, including the Patriot 3 missile. This, of course, all in the face of a more aggressive China, as you see this come together here, that will include a shipyard agreement as well, allowing Japanese workers uh, to do work on U.S. ships so they don't have to go back and forth, saving time and money, and also helping to alleviate a labor shortage in mm -hmm. shipyards here in the U.S. It just brings us back to this constant refra refrain uh, of, of, of the strengthened China, a more emboldened China in the South Sea, the South China Sea. They'll talk about how Japan might also support the AUKUS alliance, which it's not actually a member of, uh, all, all part of this uh, conversation here in Washington starting tomorrow. So all eyes, of course, are going to be on the meeting between those two leaders tomorrow. Joe, I know you also have your eye on Congress. Uh, they were away. Unfortunately, they've come back. Uh, there's a pretty long agenda of things that they're supposed to get done here, Joe. Uh, what's up? What's, yeah. uh, what are they starting with? Yeah, we said earlier lawmakers are back, and that's the problem. Uh, they, look, they don't <laughs> seem to have a path remain on anything that is on their to-do list, uh, which is pretty frustrating for leaders here. Speaker Mike Johnson has a motion to vacate hanging over his head. He could get fired if he brings Ukraine funding to the floor, for instance, and that's exactly what he plans to do. The question is when. Guys, they've been gone for two weeks. They're only back for two weeks, and then they're on recess again. Wow, nice and it's entirely likely that nothing will get done in that time. Yeah, it must be nice. Um, is the Senate going to take up the TikTok bill? Because it went through the House pretty quickly, and we know President Biden made clear what his stance on this is, and then yeah. it kind of just d died on the Senate floor. We're asking that same question, too, uh, Scarlett. It's a great question. Lobbyists are spending an enormous amount of money to keep this from happening. And the fact of the matter is, you see one of these situations with strange bedfellows where progressive Democrats and conservative Republicans both have a problem with this as a First Amendment issue and focusing specifically uh, on, on one company, whether there's uh, a fairness issue to be addressed here with the length of time that they're being given to actually get rid of TikTok to, for ByteDance to actually strip this off. Look, we can't even figure out how to fund the government here most of the time. So whether we can figure out how to get reins around TikTok remains an open question. All right, Joe, uh, always uh, great to catch up with you. Uh, stick around. Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lyons, they're coming up right after this program on Balance of Power. Greg Murphy, uh, Carissa uh, Hutchinson, and a few other uh, good guests there are going to walk you through everything going on in Washington, the White House, and Congress. Meanwhile, right here on the close, uh, we are not done. We're actually going to set you up for what to watch over the next 24 hours. This is Bloomberg. Scarlett, everyone keeps talking about the starter earnings season on Friday with the big banks, but yeah. it actually kicks off tomorrow. We're expected to get earnings out of Delta Airlines in the morning. Joining us for a preview is George Ferguson, our senior airline analyst over at Bloomberg Intelligence. And a lot of people are really focused right now on the travel sector, particularly the airlines. What's going to be the big story out of Delta tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, we're going to look very closely at yields, right? Yields are synonymous with fares. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to figure out if yields are softening or not. This is first Q2, so we should remember that. First Q is always a seasonally weak season. Mm -hmm. We think that a lot more of the airline's business has become leisure mm -hmm. as business is recovering. We'll watch what the business recovery looks like. But because it's so leisure driven, we expect 2Q and 3Q to be the best part of their earnings season anyways. But we want to see how fares fare <laughs> against last year's 1Q. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We want to see, again, how, if, is business back? Uh, what's been real strength for Delta has been international, mm -hmm. as well as the um, front of the airplane leisure, right? So, you know, high-end leisure. We we'll want to see how those two are are doing. Uh, we think that basic fares are doing poorly. But, you know, we think that we have to compete with Spirit, Frontier, and those kind of airlines. That's the softest part of the business, and so we'll look for commentary on that as well to figure out if the, that budget traveler has got a lot more options getting better fares. Mm -hmm. And what Delta is seeing in terms of demand for the busy travel season that's coming up as well. Yep. Does Delta face any Boeing issues, or is it an Airbus? Delta is largely an Airbus shop, so mm -hmm. I expect them to gain 
from uh, carriers that are having Boeing problems. Okay, got it. And then all, when it costs, comes to also, I mean, we get to this idea of leisure travel here. What about that bounce back in corporate travel? I was always, I was always under the impression for these airlines that was kind of a cash cow, kind of, or at least a higher margin. Is that still not the case? Has that come back to pre-pandemic levels? So it hasn't fully come yeah. back. I think what we heard during 4Q is we were around 90% back. Um, so, yeah, we're going to look to see if that gap is closed. But 90%, right. though, that's pretty good, right? You'd think so, yeah. right? But that I guess yeah. that 10% lack, mm -hmm. that, like you said, they're really nice price points mm -hmm. on business travelers you know, mm -hmm. for, the, for their fares, and so it hurts. They've supplemented it with high-end leisure, mm -hmm. but high-end leisure doesn't typically come in at the same price point. Yeah. Uh, so, again, we'd love to see business coming back. That would do more to balance out the earnings throughout the year. Yeah, those are all the people who are saying, you know what, I'd rather Zoom than jet over somewhere, I meet so. for an hour, and then jet back. I think so. What about fuel? Because jet fuel prices have mm. been rising because of rising oil prices overall. Yep. What has been Delta's strategy thus far when fuel prices jump uh, suddenly? So Delta doesn't hedge, but Delta owns a refinery. And the refinery helps them with, um, with, the, with the crack margin, right, the difference between uh, base crude and the refined product. Um, but, you know, for first Q, actually fuel was pretty well contained. We're seeing it rise now. It's more of a worry in second Q and third Q if this continues. Mm -hmm. What we'll also see in one Q, the bigger problem will be the pilots. The pilots, they had 20 plus percent pay increases last year. That's gonna put a big dent in margins for one Q. We expect margins to be below mm -hmm. the year prior or close mm -hmm. in one Q of this year. And just final quick question here. Are there any other sort of outstanding union issues that we need to uh, be focusing oh, on? There always seem yeah. to be union issues inside yeah. this business, but the big one, the pilots are out of the way, mm -hmm. um, but there's always mechanics and other parts of the business that uh, get increases, but nowhere near the size of the pilots. So I think it's largely behind them. All right, George Ferguson there, the best of Bloomberg Intelligence, a really nice preview, Scarlett, yeah. uh, for those earnings. It's actually the only uh, big earnings that we get tomorrow, Delta, but that is going to be the kickoff uh, to the earnings season tomorrow. Uh, we will have full coverage of that on team surveillance, but there's quite a few other things that we also have to keep an eye on, including uh, overnight here over in New Zealand, we're expecting to get a rate decision out of the Reserve Bank there. Yeah, the New Zealand Central Bank. They're the first one to target 2% inflation. Yeah, I mean, blame they, they're, them. they're the Yeah, yeah blame, blame New Zealand, <laughs> not Canada. Uh, but <laughs> Bank of Canada also coming out with its rate decision, so blame them both. That's all. And then, of course, we're going to go over to Asia mm -hmm. because South Korea... We have some elections going yeah, on. So yeah, so some critical elections. We'll be monitoring all that along with uh, the trade in the one and the Korean Kospi, and we'll keep you posted on the, all those developments there. Yeah, so this is actually a big international focus, and you wonder how this is going to uh, bleed into the U.S. markets. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister and President Biden meeting at the White House tomorrow. Yeah, and they're going to stress uh, all the economic cooperation that there is that exists between the two countries. One thing that they may not bring up that's kind of going to hang over them what's that? is what happens with Nippon Steel. Yeah. Right. And it's bid for U.S. Yeah. Steel. And well, they'll Biden talk has, about it. Well, they won't. It won't be yeah. part of the readout. Yeah, but they're not. Yeah, they're not going to tell us. <laughs> tell us what, what they said here. But that's a good point, and it gets to this whole idea of how do you sort of create an allyship there or strengthen that allyship at a time where you're still kind of doing protectionist policies. Yeah. yeah. All right, and then that uh, brings us back to Washington here. Uh, uh, I thought Congress had other things to do, but apparently they're actually going to move forward with this impeachment process uh, for Mayorkas. You know what? Maybe this is yeah. something that they can get done over the course of two weeks because they're only back in office weeks. for two weeks before yeah. they're off again uh, for recess. So as not Bill Ukraine, told us. not budget deals, not That's TikTok. too complicated. Okay, not too complicated. And, of course, we bring you back to the markets here. And, of course, in addition to the CPI data in the morning, we get those FOMC minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be back then. This is The Close on Bloomberg.